All right. That's so nice to see all of your faces. Welcome, everyone. Um, hello, my name is Madeline Fitzgerald, and I am the manager of adult programs here at the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art. Thank you all for joining us this evening for the live podcast of Mountain and Prairie with host Ed Roberson and guest Spencer Wigmore and James Prosek. Um, we are here tonight to celebrate the exhibition Trespassers, James Prosek and the Texas Prairie, which will be on view through May 12th, 2024. On behalf of the museum, I would especially like to welcome and thank our members who are in the audience this evening. It is because of your generosity that our collection and special exhibitions are free and open to everyone. I would also like to thank the Art Bridges Foundation's Access for All program for their generous support of Second Thursdays at the Carter. Every second Thursday, you can connect with art through cocktails, conversations, and creativity. Each month, you'll find something different from performances, artist talks, and unique tours to art making, music, and films. We want to especially thank our supporters for helping make the Trespassers exhibition possible. Kim and Glenn Darden, the Richard P. Garmany Fund at the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, Jones Wajahat family, and Fernando Urito. I would also like to thank the staff at Hired Hands for providing American Sign Language interpretation for tonight, tonight's talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I have the uh, great pleasure of introducing our speakers this evening. Our host, Ed Roberson, is a Colorado-based conservationist and the creator of Mountain and Prairie, a top-ranked podcast that has been recognized by the Aspen Institute, Patagonia, The Nature Conservancy, Cowboy Artists of America, Maxwell Alexander Gallery, the Arthur M. Blank Family Foundation, the Montana Governor's Office, and more. For nearly two decades, Ed's career has focused on land, water, and conservation in the American West. He worked as conservation director at Palmer Land Conservancy, a ranch broker throughout the Intermountain West, and a board member and advisor to numerous Colorado conservation organizations. He holds a BA in economics and an MBA from Wake Forest University. Joining Ed in conversation this evening are Spencer Wigmore and James Prosek. Spencer Wigmore is curator of fine art collections at the Minnesota Historical Society in St. Paul, Minnesota. Before starting this role in the fall of 2023, he was the associate curator of painting, sculpture, and works on paper here at the Carter, where he curated nearly a dozen exhibitions, including Trespassers, James Prosek, and the Texas Prairie. He is the co-author of the Carter Handbook and the editor of a forthcoming multi-author volume on the fraught legacy of Charles M. Russell. He earned his PhD in art history at the University of Delaware and is currently revising a book on the landscape painter Albert Bierstadt. James Prosek is an artist, writer, naturalist, and Yale graduate who published his first book at 19 years of age. Prosek's work has been shown at numerous museums and galleries, including the Royal Academy of Arts in London, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in Richmond, Virginia, the Asia Society of Hong Kong Center, and the Smithsonian American Art Museum, among other institutions. With solo exhibitions at the Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum in Ridgefield, Connecticut, the Addison Gallery of American Art, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the New Britain Museum of American Art, the Buffalo Bill Center of the West, the Yale University Art Gallery, and the National Academy of Sciences in Washington, D.C., among many others. Prosek is the author of over a dozen books and has written for the New York Times and National Geographic magazine. In 2003, he won a Peabody Award for his documentary about traveling through England in the footsteps of Isaac Walton, the 17th century author of The Complete Angler. He co-founded a conservation initiative called World Trout in 2004 with Yvonne Schnard, the owner of Patagonia Clothing Company, which has given $4 million to over 200 fish conservation groups. Immediately following their conversation, we will transition into a Q&A with all of you. I have a microphone that, we will, uh, uh, allow, for, that will allow for your questions 
questions to be heard in the recording of the talk, which will up be uploaded to the Mountain and Prairie podcast and the Carter's YouTube channel in the coming weeks. Please join me in welcoming Mountain and Prairie. Thank, thanks, Madeline. Um, it's a real honor to be here. Uh, whenever I hear resumes like these two guys, I'm, I'm always just like, how did, I, how did I end up here with all these super smart people? But when I, when I started the podcast nearly eight years ago, it was really just kind of a side project to talk about uh, you know, subjects that interested, interested me, but probably more important, the people that were behind these subjects that interested me. And it started out with a real focus on conservation. And then it's very quickly started going in all these different directions into art, into natural history, into, uh, you know, philosophy. And kind of the longer it's gone on, the more esoteric it's gotten. And I was talking to my wife, and I was saying, if you pictured all the subjects that I'm interested in on a Venn diagram, there's this overlap in the middle, and it's kind of like a pinprick. And I thought, I bet I'm the only person in the world that has all these weird interests put on this one spot. And then Spencer was nice enough to introduce me to James, and James has, not only does he have all those interests, but he operates at an extreme high level in all of those subjects. And so he's kind of like my, in some ways, my soulmate for all these <laughs> crazy things that I'm, that I'm interested in. So it's just been great getting to know both of these guys. And I was thinking we, we could start with Spencer, because I, I believe when I think about your role in this amazing show, you're kind of the, the bookends, you know, the, the initial spark, and then you actually helped install the, 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 the program. And so I was wondering if you could talk a bit about how this came into your mind. What was the initial spark of an idea that led you to approach James and, and tell him what you were about your crazy idea? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a crazy idea. Um, really, I think it's kind of two threads that came together in this wonderful serendipitous way where in, um, I think it was maybe the spring of 2019, my colleague Maggie Adler had been in touch with James about borrowing a picture to display in our collection galleries as a loan. And I was helping with the logistics of this and just got chatting with James. And there was just this shared wavelength, the two of us, like really from the start, like hit it off. He had this sensibility and attentiveness to the natural world that really resonated. And I immediately was like, I want to work with this guy. Like, what can I do here at the Carter that can make this happen? And um, often when working with contemporary artists, the Carter is really invested in exploring Texas history and culture. And I knew, okay, that was the angle I wanted to find with James. And I was thinking about ideas and I had this flashback to my childhood where I, I grew up in um, a suburb of Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, Elk River. And I was fortunate to have a summer job working with this local conservationist, Dave Anderson, who did small scale prairie restorations on city properties. And the thing about these restorations is that they are in really mundane, boring <laughs> spaces on some level. It's a median on the road. It's a corner around a parking lot. It's an industrial lot. And these, I fell in love with prairies in these mundane spaces that just didn't fit my conceptualization of what was natural, what was wild. And I got thinking about that uncertainty and I brought it to James as an artist who's really invested in those boundaries of the, the human and non-human and where they intersect and merge. And I said, you know, these spaces really resonate with me. There's this amazing grassland conservation world in Texas that I'm just learning about. Would you want to explore it with me? And it just blossomed from there into a really extraordinary three-year journey of working really closely with him to, to shape this project. And so, James, what was your initial thought being a, a guy from the Northeast and somebody comes to you and says, I want you to dive deep into Texas grasslands? Because when you, when you find a subject that you want to <clears throat> learn about, you go very deep. So what was that uh, first conversation like from your memory? Well, I think I said, heck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, uh, yeah, I, it didn't really matter to me that I knew nothing about grass, you know. <laughs> Because, uh, but I, after the first, the first trip we took, Spencer set up and Maggie, I think, helped too. Thank you, Maggie. Um, uh, some appointments with ranch managers, conservationists, ranch owners, um, 
people who are experts in restoration, landscape architects, and mm -hmm. people from all different fields. And we met in different, uh, mostly restoration sites outside of Austin and San Antonio. And uh, I, I, grass to me was the stuff that grew in the, the highway medians, you know, along I-95 in Connecticut <laughs> or on your lawn. <laughs> Uh, but these people were like, this was like grass enthusiasm that I never, you know, heard of before. <laughs> and I, I realized that there's something really amazing about the Texas, the Texans' relationship with grass. Sure. And as I, you know, came to do more research and met more people, Matt White, his name will come up probably again and again. He actually recommended I read the first hundred pages of Robert Caro's the first volume of the, the um, I made it about 100 pages in. I want to keep reading the <laughs> biography of Lyndon Johnson and the describes the, the country that the Johnson family settled mm -hmm. in, in the hill country and how they, they were seduced by the grass because there was this beautiful tall grass, prairie grass, and they thought, oh, we can plow it and grow crops. They didn't know that they get very little rainfall in this grass that adapted to live in very harsh conditions west of the 100th meridian. It's almost you know, qualifies as a desert, I guess. But um, so they they suppressed fire, which was an essential part of, mm -hmm. you know, maintaining grasslands. But there's so many directions. I mean, I, I could just keep, I don't know how to keep me focused, but <laughs> um, I, uh, they, they did a couple things wrong. I mean, according to Caro and other people, they, they suppressed fire, which yep. was one of the essential forces that kept the grasslands open. They overgrazed the ground, killed the grass, the roots and soil washed away. And um, those were the two big sins. And then, <laughs> you know, basically the grass that they depended on and, and brought, brought them there to, to settle and, you know, graze their animals was gone. And, mm -hmm. But the grass, you know, these people that on that first trip, I'd never seen somebody get so ecstatic about a stand of, now I know what it's called, yellow Indian grass or blue, big blue stem grass. And I, as a visual artist, I was just like, wow, these grasses, once I started looking, they're so beautiful. They, they have sometimes like a, a glaucous haze on the stem or mm -hmm. the stem's not even a, a, an, an anatomical term for grass. There, it's something else, but I don't know. But, and, the, and the colors change with the seasons, just yeah. like trees and, and, and I wanted to, I wanted to paint these, you know, grasses and wildflowers as individuals, you know, mm -hmm. take, take one piece of big blue stem out, paint it on a piece of paper. So I started painting them and, and I realized some of them are really big. They're like eight feet tall. Yeah. So <laughs> I was like, I'm going to need to join a couple pieces of paper together. And so, so the, the grasses started to cross the boundaries between the pieces of paper. And that started as a practical concern. But then I thought, well, maybe, you know, that kind of makes sense conceptually because the prairies have been fragmented. When you see the prairies from the air, you know, they're, they're, they're carved up in boxes. And mm -hmm. so painting the grasses, trespassing across these boundaries also kind of expressed the forces that the grasses needed to, to exist, which fire yep. and migratory herds of grazing animals, which don't obey boundaries. And of course, Europeans came and they put up property lines and fences and, and it just, it was a tension between the the what I've learned, and I'll stop soon. <laughs> Keep going. Um, it, what I've learned and really become obsessed with, and it, this is part of my obsessive compulsive maybe issues, but um, are that that fire, the human use of fire, like is an extraordinarily important part of sure. North American history, and supposedly, and I'll read a. I mean, from what I've been learning, even in New England. Like, the indigenous people burned the land a lot. Mm -hmm. And they did that in part to create more grassland habitat mm -hmm. to um, obviously more habitat for grazing animals means you inflate the, the population of grazing animals. So they were essentially farming elk, deer, and bison. But sure. So there were a lot of things that attracted me within the first couple of days to, to grasses and prairies. And because, because I do have an interest in my other, in my previous work in in boundaries and lines that humans draw in the landscape that that could be the lines between things when we name things in nature mm -hmm. take an interconnected natural world and carve it up or 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 
physical boundaries like walls and fences. But mm-hmm. so I don't know if I answered your question. No, that's I, I, that definitely <laughs> answers the question. And when we were talking on the phone, or, or I guess we had a, a Zoom call a while back, and you mentioned something that I thought was fascinating, where you said that grasslands in North America, you think of them almost like the pyramids in Egypt. Well, Can you talk more about that? Because I, I keep thinking about that over and over. This kind of came out of a conversation with Matt, because um, we've been talking a lot about grasses over the last couple of years. Um, that, that I should read, maybe I should read a quote from <laughs> Please. this crazy guy, Stephen Pine, who's like the North American fire historian, wrote a book called Fire in America. And it's, it's a slog, but... If you get interested in fire, it's kind of interesting. Um, fire, and, fire and grass are genetically associated. This was written in the eight, 1980s, and this, this narrative about the importance of fire has not caught on. I don't know if it's because people grew up with Smokey the Bear, you know, fires are bad, but um, fire was everything, and it, it, a huge... I just don't know where to start. But fire and grass are genetically associated, taken in its broadest meaning... Meanings to include plains, prairies, barrens, savannas, and wetlands. Grasslands were probably the dominant cover type in North America at the time of European discovery, except for the high plains where the short grass expanses were more or less determined by climate. Nearly all these grasslands were created by man, the product of deliberate routine firing. This description includes even the tall grass prairies east of the 100th meridian, which basically divides Texas in half which combined with the high plains made the largest continuous grassland in the world. So, um, yeah, the idea of, of so if, if this guy, Stephen Pine, he's not the only one to have written this, and, and this is, you know, there are many, many early colonial accounts of, of how the, the indigenous people burned, mm-hmm. when they burned, why they burned. They burned carelessly. They burned intentionally. They burned, burned, burned. Um, that... That if this is true, that they accelerated a natural process, the grasses evolved with lightning that made fires, and, but, but maybe lightning would burn an area every 15, 20 years, but they accelerated that pace that annually, maybe it, possibly even more frequently. But that means that these, these habitats were created by people and tended for thousands of years, mm-hmm. which made us think like, these are equivalent to America's equivalent to um, ancient monuments in in other parts of the world because they were made by people. They're, but yep. they're made by people in in collaboration with nature, with evolution, with God's creation, whatever mm-hmm. you know perspective you have on it. But I that may be a slightly radical, maybe not um, idea. But I think when you think of and in Connecticut again. We had um, we had lesser prairie chickens living in Connecticut, which went extinct in the 1920s. They called them heath hens. The last ones went extinct in 1920 in Martha's Vineyard. But I went in the herbaria specimens at the Peabody Museum of Natural History at Yale, and I was looking in the 1860s, 1880s, 1890s. There are, there are press specimens from my county, Fairfield County in Connecticut, of big blue stem, little blue stem, switchgrass, Indian grass, Indian paintbrush, which there was one in the in the rare plant records last year in Connecticut. There was they found one blooming individual left in wow. Connecticut. That was a very common species back then. And I'm an artist who obviously has an interest in ecology, <laughs> but uh, it, that's a serious shift. And and the forest that the Europeans saw was mostly because disease was spread so early by the earliest settlers in the, let's say, the early 1600s, mm-hmm. that by the time the majority of the Europeans came by the 1750s, the forest had already gr- grown back. So half of New England could have been a grassland, maybe more. Um, obviously, it was mixed forest and grassland, but I forget what the question was. Sorry. No, they're about the purest. No, that's, that's great. <laughs> and I'll tell you, J- James, he, uh, we did another podcast episode, and I, it could have easily been four or five hours, and I would have just been completely zoned in. Everything he says, wow. is, I, I love it. Um, one question I do have about the actual work is your process, because I noticed when I was, when I was walking around this morning, some of the pieces, when I'm thinking about the watercolors, were produced 
at your studio at home. Some were produced here in Texas. And so I'd love to hear more about the actual process of painting. Like, were you doing it on site? I also heard a rumor that you're a night owl and that you like to paint very, very late into the night. And so could you just talk a bit about your process? Yeah, um, a lot of the paintings were made, you know, I, I do kind of get into really making close observations of, of particular places. And a lot of the, while well, the works in this show are definitely site specific. I, you'll see if you read the messy handwriting at the bottom and some of the captions that some of them were based on specimens from Texas and some were based on specimens from Connecticut. Mm -hmm. That's only because after that first trip, I realized that I, I'd seen some of these grasses. I had sort of a nostalgic response, especially with little blue stem, this beautiful grass. I was like, I know I've seen that growing near my house. And so I, there's, there's an abandoned meadow behind this school um, within walking distance of my house. And I, um, I found all four of the tall grass prairie species there. Now, two or three of them may have been planted, but I don't know how they, who would have planted them back mm -hmm. then. I really think it's unlikely. And, and I've talked, you know, anyway, so I, I um, yes, Matt, Matt will tell you because he traveled a lot with me. Some were made in hotel rooms. We would, I would get all the lamps in the room and move them into one little circle or go to the Dollar General and get like five or six lamps. <laughs> Matt has them now at his house or the, the Airbnb in Marfa where we stayed for a couple weeks or because during the day you're kind of out looking at stuff uh -huh. and um, you know, the, for me, one of the big things that's come out of the drawing all those grasses are really looking closely at the shadows that they cast mm -hmm. on the paper. So the shadows tell you that somebody plucked this grass and put it on a surface. So it's not growing in its environment. It's already been kind of man manipulated by a human somehow. Um, but the shadows, you know, I've been thinking about shadows uh, because they're beautiful, but you know, I was able to draw the grass straight ahead um, and look at it from that perspective, mm -hmm. but the light's always coming from a different angle. So the light shows you the architecture of the plant from a different angle, but it's, and it's a representation of the plant made in the absence of something, in the absence of light. So it's almost automatically a, a memorial, kind of like a silhouette. Um, and there's also, a, um, it's tied to the origin of drawing because the, in Europe, at least, Pliny the Elder in his Natural History of 100 AD, I forget when it was, <laughs> um, wrote that the story of the origin of drawing in Greece and, and Egypt was that it was a tracing of a human shadow on the wall. And it makes sense because it's a, shadows are good cues to humans of, as to how to transfer or translate a three-dimensional world into a two-dimensional surface, like a re reflection on a lake is another one, or a mirror. Um, but so there were, the story is there, were, there was a daughter of a potter and her lover was leaving on a journey and she wanted something to remember him by so she traced his shadow on the wall and then because I guess she was in a potter's studio the first, after the first drawing this, the first sculpture was made based on the shadow. <laughs> but, um, but I like that idea of the shadow and, or the silhouette being a m almost a memorial to the thing because it, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's presence, but it's also absence at the same time. Um, but so the, the works were made, um, a lot of them were made, some were made during the day, some were made at night. Um, and because the grass, even the grasses, flowers we know are, are they bloom, they're very ephemeral. They, they last for a short amount of time, they go away. You pluck some of these flowers, we'd be walking around for an hour I, I did learn quickly that if you don't put them in water immediately, they just droop. So I carry around, you know, a water bottle cut off at the top with a huge bouquet of flowers. <laughs> and we were in some rough places, like in, in Missouri. Most of the show was in Texas, but in Missouri, these these two guys drive up in a pickup truck, and they're like, "So what are you guys doing?" <laughs> <laughs> and I'm carrying this huge bouquet of flowers, and, <laughs> and I'm like, uh, "I'm painting flowers," and <laughs> my friend's an expert in remnant prairies, and and um, and then they look in the car, they see Matt. We travel with a part of his large family. He's got four daughters and a wife, so at that point, there were two daughters and a wife in the back, and they're looking in the car. They're like, "Hmm." 
they're just trying to figure out what's going on. <laughs> um, but, and they're like, yeah, before the conservationists got a hold of this prairie, it was much better. And I'm like, I'm not going to take their word for it. I'm not going to argue. But um, anyway, so yeah, it w there was a lot of field work, I guess, is one way yeah. to answer the question. Cool. And, and, and a lot of lamps. <laughs> um, and Spencer, one of the things that's become clear from talking to both of you is that this, this pr what we see installed now was really the result of a collaboration between both of you guys. And you spent so much time on the road together and traveling all over. And so, Spencer, I'd love to hear more about kind of the, the role that you played and kind of the, I, I know there, was, there can be kind of almost like push and pull in the best possible way between the curator and the artist. And so, Spencer, could you just talk a bit about, from your perspective, some of the, the, the road trips you went on and kind of how you helped how you helped James kind of come up with this final product that we've seen up there? This is so beautiful. Yeah. I'm still finding seed and plant fragments in the <laughs> trunk of my car. In your car. It's been <laughs> years. Um, Maybe some will sprout. Yeah. I, I think early on, you know, we were both learning about this world together. And I viewed my role as a curator primarily as a facilitator in that I knew very quickly exploring this world that there were a ton of extraordinary people invested in conservation in Texas, but they weren't always talking to each other. There were all these really intensive siloed conversations you know, with landowners, with biologists, with conservationists. And I wanted to think about how to give James an inter interdisciplinary perspective on what it was that he was doing. Like I wanted to do what I could to ensure that when we were out in the field, there might be three or four people with different um, perspectives that could be kind of talking about and sharing their insights and perspectives on what's here in the hope that those conversations might also have an afterlife of, of their own. And I think what's been interesting about those collaborations as they've taken place is like how consistent James's vision for what this project has been, even as the subjects that we're working with have evolved over time. Like to give a brief example, when I started this project, you know, I was I'm really interested as a historian in what it means when we create a boundary around a concept like nature and say all of these things <laughs> outside of it are not natural. And James's work is about the fiction of those boundaries and how there's this porousness. And I was interested in expressing that through the stories of the fraught history of say invasive grasses in Texas and the complicated history of grazing and the idea of introducing restorations into prairies and urban spaces, for instance. And we had a lot of really productive conversations around those. And then James's interest started to gravitate towards remnant prairies and the kind of complicated presence that they have, not just having this extraordinary ecological abundance by being unt you know, untouched, I say that in, quote, in quotes, but also that they are often traces of a much longer, richer history of human interaction with the land that you know, outdates the United States by thousands of years in many cases. But throughout that, you know, James is always just so laser focused on looking for these boundaries as they're surfacing and looking for ways that through his art, he can kind of transgress or complicate or work or work with those. So on some level, my role was trying to have as many conversations as I could, try and show him as many different spaces as I could, while just trusting that the work would just emerge out of that from there. So with from that respect, it was a really seamless and enjoyable collaboration to just be out with all of these different people and their worldviews. And then James is distilling it into the ideas that have really stayed consistent with him. You know, talking about the ways that color on trout shift are being similar to the ways that colors of grasses shift. There is this consistency that was really exciting as a curator. It made my job easy. Well, Spencer, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I'm grateful to him for introducing me to grass because he grew up in Minnesota. I think that was part of his nostalgic consciousness too. And um, But he also helped coordinate, especially in the early, the first year, a lot of um, relationships with people in Texas who owned land or, you know, knew things. And, you know, through, through different avenues, you know, we met Matt. And, but, you know, Spencer really had already helped build a network for me that was a, a starting point. Um, 
and uh, so I'm I'm really grateful for that. One specific piece, I mean, we could we could spend an hour on each one of those pieces, but but one that caught my eye was the Fort Worth composition number one, and that one in a lot of ways, in my from my untrained eye, I'm sitting here with two experts, but it, it you know all the other work there up there is very, you know, based on the natural world. And that one has more human elements than natural elements. And I'd love to hear more about that piece and what the inspiration behind that was. You want me to talk? Yeah, <laughs> for both of you. If I don't want to call out people by name necessarily because they may not want to be called out by name, but I'll say his first name at some point. But I, I was, you know, this project started in Fort Worth and then I... I I happen to know somebody through my relationship with um, with Yale and the museums at Yale, who you know spent a lot of time in Fort Worth, grew up in Fort Worth, and also is involved with the, for lack of a better word, the cowboy culture of Fort Worth, <laughs> and the ranching culture. And 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 Ed was very generous also in you know showing me his land and, and stuff, and you know talking about there are just so many people who've come from different directions and taught me things about this um this world of of the human relationship to grass which is thousands of years old and um you know the other authors have called humans pyrophytes we're fire dependent animals and a lot of the a lot of the grasses we cultivated are are fire dependent also um a lot of the grains and and the animals we domesticated are fire dependent because they depend on fire to maintain the grasslands so so the ranching culture this is a this fort worth composition piece has a bunch of silhouettes of cowboys and and um and you know uh, different images associated with cowboy mm -hmm. culture <laughs> sure guns uh lariats um Spurs, uh, and there's a painting of a of a, a longhorn cow in the middle, or bull. <laughs> I'm not sure I even know the difference. I know the difference, but <laughs> <laughs> so I I felt like you know because uh, and I and I was told by Ed educated that that uh, Fort Worth is where the West begins. That's what makes it different than Dallas. And so I wanted because the show is in Fort Worth, I wanted to comment on that that culture, which it really. I think started uh, dependent on grass and um and uh you know I, it it's the only piece in the show I think that has human figures um but it's facing the largest piece in the show which is a composition of silhouettes of all the different animals that have lived in the prairie and there's 17 that are painted in color ones that to me you know communicated special stories and um so uh so yeah, I still haven't been to the rodeo, but I'm planning to go in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> uh, but I, I just was aware that this culture existed and yep. that it was an important part of Fort Worth and an important part of the history of grasslands, and mm -hmm. it just kind of happened. But nothing, nothing, nothing really beyond that. There was, there were no really deep thoughts about it. It was okay. just kind of. I just want to make a picture with cowboys. Yeah, there it is, right there. <laughs> You know, it's just, it's fun. It, it, it could be seen as controversial or, you know, but it, it, I didn't mean it to be that way. I love that. And um, another very obvious piece when you walk in that will, you know, when the show leaves, it will leave is the mural. And I think people who are familiar with your work know about how you'll, you'll label with numbers, um, you know, these black and white silhouettes. But for people who are, are not familiar with that, could you talk about why you do that, why you do the numbers, but then there's, there's, no, silhouettes. there's well, no key. Yeah. Well, I'm attracted to the silhouettes because, you know, the earliest drawings we know are basically outlines of animals and things on rock walls. I think humans have been drawing for a long, long, long time, longer than we have evidence of. And and I'm really interested in that history. I, I think, and I won't get into it too deeply, but that, you know, humans were, were following passive um, marks left by animals for a long time, tracking animals because then they could catch up to them and kill them. And at a certain point, they're like, oh, you know, these marks carry a lot of useful information. Maybe we can, instead of just making them passively by walking in the mud or the snow, we can make them intentionally. And somebody probably had a hand covered in blood and they went, oog, on the wall. <laughs> and, you know, that, that's the first drawing. I mean, to me, the first, 
mark made with intent and then look at it and reflect on that and be like, uh, you know, that, that handprint was made by my grandfather <laughs> and that these marks can actually survive uh, many generations, thousands of generations even, and communicate a lot. And, and these marks evolved into our, you know, drawing, into pictographs, into mm -hmm. our written languages. So, so the silhouette's something I'm interested in, but, but more specifically with these murals of silhouettes and numbers, I had these, these, these field guides as a kid, and I loved these field guides of birds in North America or whatever, and, and some of them had these silhouettes in the end papers, and each of the silhouettes had a number next to it, and the number match up to, matches up to a list of names of the birds, let's say, to help us learn how to identify them in the field. And often in the field, the bird is backlit, you don't get to see the whole thing, um, and oftentimes you just get a silhouette, which can communicate a great deal of information. Um, but so I started making these murals based on these field guides as a commentary about the human urge to and necessity to name and order the natural world. So I paint the silhouettes and the numbers, but there's no key of names. So people can't satisfy that urge to, to know what they're called. So they're like looking for the key sometimes, or they're not. And like, I mean, I'm taunting them a little bit, but, um, <laughs> but I, I'm interested in what I'm interested in, and this goes back to the bounded world versus the boundless world. Yeah. And, and I feel like humans have lived in a tension between, it's, it's pretty much also the ordered world and the, and the non-ordered world, or the world that hasn't been ordered, the world with maps and the world where you travel without maps. And, or the, to me, the named world and the unnamed world is the same. The named world is the world we, where we take an interconnected holistic continuum that's constantly changing and we draw lines between it and we label the pieces. To me, that is a trauma that we subject nature to. We, we carve it into pieces, we chop it up. And then we expect when we name those pieces and talk about nature that the, that the pieces will make the whole again. But once you carve it up, the whole is different. It's not mm -hmm. the whole anymore. <laughs> yeah. But, but, you know, communicating with language is really good, and we couldn't have this conversation without it. And when you put the pieces back together, you actually create sometimes a different hole that's just as rich as the hole that existed before. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's a little bit about the the commentary about our dependence on language. It's kind of like you know, traveling without a map. Mm -hmm. You know, just looking at nature without needing to label it, um, or or at least just just acknowledging, helping myself and maybe other people acknowledge how dependent we are on, on tools like language. There's a quote in a Wallace Stegner novel where he says, order is the dream of man. And ever since our first conversation, I, I've thought about that, about how you kind of push these boundaries and even the, the playfulness of having the numbers without the key. I mean, I think it's a very interesting concept. One other, another question about one of the pieces up there, several of the pieces the charred wood and the, the charred bust with the grass growing out. It's, it's interesting to me that you know, everything we're talking about, the grasslands and with fire, it's things you know, come and go. They, they, they're, they grow and then they die and then they go into the ground and then they're reborn over and over. Whereas bronze is about as permanent as you can right, get. Right. Could you talk about, was that a, a, a conscious choice? I mean, in part, I mean, a lot of these things happen because I see something I think is pretty and then, or that I'm attracted to and then I want to make it. And, but then after the fact, I construct some baloney narrative about it. <laughs> but, tell on podcast. But, yeah. it's, but it's real. It's, it, it is real. And I, so I, I the, the fire, the, the, uh, the burn logs in the show are cast in bronze, but, and, I, every year for the last 20 years, I've had this really big New Year's Eve bonfire <laughs> in my backyard in the woods. And one of the years I was just picking through the, the ashes and I was like, wow, these chunks of burned wood are really beautiful. Like they're, they're shiny, they're like graphite-y, they're, they're craggy. And I, I went through a, a long process of trying to work with the foundry to, to cast them in brown, bronze to make them permanent because you can't. You can't make, we've figured out, you can't really make a mold. 
Mm -hmm. Typically, you make a mold of something you want to cast in bronze. You make a wax from the mold. Then you make a ceramic shell around the wax. And then you pour the bronze in the ceramic shell. It melts the wax out, and you get a bronze object. <laughs> With the burned wood, you can't make a wax, a, a, a rubber mold because it's so brittle. So, so I worked with this guy. He's like, maybe we can build the ceramic shell around the wood, make a hole in the bottom, and then blow, blow air in there and make a really hot fire and burn the wood out from inside the ceramic shell and then make the bronze. Anyway, that's, that's technical stuff. But it, it took a couple years to figure it out. This show gave me an opportunity to show the, these burned logs because <laughs> fire was something I wanted to um, talk about uh, as a force that's necessary on the prairies. Um, but yes, and the, and the flowers are made of clay. Um, both of them, as you said, are, and we talked about this, Spencer and I have talked about this, they're very ephemeral. Flowers bloom for a couple of days and then mm -hmm. they stop flowering. So you're making, you're making the impermanent permanent. And that's, again, another thing that humans do. By creating order, we create a world that we, can, we think we can depend on. I call it the myth of order, because it's not the, most of the orders we rely on are fabricated by us. And um, by making the impermanent permanent, we create this illusion that permanence exists. And it helps us with our mortality. Um, I was visiting somebody years ago in Jupiter, Florida, and anybody's driven around. <laughs> Jupiter knows that like the hedges are trimmed perfectly. Everything's like a, 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 a leaf falls on the ground and some <laughs> landscapers there ready to pick it up. And, you know, they're hiding the illusion that things are changing because we're all going to die. And we don't like being constantly reminded that things are changing. So we create these, again, kind of myths of order that help us with this. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, really the, I wanted to make, pretty flowers in burn logs because <laughs> I thought they looked good together. But that's, that's, that's sort of um, part of the, the idea behind it. Um, when, I really do like love these plants. I, I don't know where that comes from. E.O. Wilson called it biophilia. But part of, the, part, of the, part of the adoration is manifested in trying to create a, a version of it. Like sure. not duplicate it, but even as a kid when I was painting fish, I loved these trout so much. I cannot describe the, mm -hmm. the feeling. I can't resurrect it now. I'm a different person. But um, drawing them helped me. Like, drawing was a way that I, um, you know, was able to work out my emotions about them or something. Sure. You know, making a representation of, of something. When we, we talked a lot about that in our our first podcast episode about how drawing, particularly drawing trout, helped James to really have a deep understanding. So I'm not trying to endlessly plug my podcast, but <laughs> it's, it's really great um, to hear James talk about that. This is a very, very basic question, but I'm curious about it. And um, talk about making the, the clay flowers that are coming out. Because I was, when I was looking this morning, I even broke out my reading glasses because I was, these, these things have to be real. They look, yeah. they look so real. And well, so you know, artists have to keep their secrets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could tell us a completely wrong story. I will, I will say that I, about probably 15 years ago, I, was, I wanted to make these sort of taxidermy displays of hybrid creatures. So I'd make like a taxidermy fox with a wing on it and like a flying <laughs> fox, you know. It's, but it was sleeping by the moss, and I wanted to have some, some native plants, things that look like native plants growing out of them. I, I did some research trying to, you know, there are um, companies that make things for museums and stuff, and, and none of them really looked that good. I, didn't, I wasn't that happy with them. Even, even places like the Buffalo Bill Center of the West, they have, like, fake plants, and the, mm -hmm. the Peabody Museum at Yale has really good ones. <laughs> The American Museum of Natural History. Some were made of silk. Some were, but how do you, how do you fix uh, something like a flower in a? So I, it's a longer story. But I met this woman from Thailand who, um, there's a there's sort of a pretty robust hobby there, and maybe other parts of Southeast Asia where people make these mostly tropical orchids and stuff out of a, a clay, and. Um, they use this clay called luna clay that's made in Japan. You can knead the 
the color into it, um, oil paint, and then put it through a pasta maker to flatten it out, cut out the forms, kind of. But but I met this. So I met this woman who I saw some like tropical orchids she made in the Adirondacks. I mean, it's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> I sought her out, and I she every couple of years she visits her sister who's also from Thailand, but married to a guy from upstate New York. And um, so I started visiting and um, learning how to make them from her. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, uh, it's, when I first saw her make like a, a lady slipper orchid or something, I was like, it looked like, I was like God was making the thing, like the parts she laid out. I'm telling you like the, it, it's a, it's an interesting process. There's a little alchemy in it. Uh, well, the, the <laughs> but, end result but is sometimes stunning. even sometimes even you actually using plant material like the grass in the show has not all of its clay. It's, sure, some of it's also, but it's not like a freeze dried plant or something. Um, it's it's it, beautiful. But I'm not saying they're good. But I I'm giving I some credit. I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm trying to give some credit to this woman who you know helped me kind of learn how to make them. And but it's. Anyway, well, and we'll have, uh, there'll be time after this. If you haven't gone up, you, you need to go take a very close look at those. Don't trip and fall on them, though. That wouldn't be good. Um, Spencer, one question for you. Uh, you know, you obviously had this spark of an idea, and then you were, you and James went along this journey to, to have what we have upstairs. And what's been the biggest surprise for you? I mean, I, I know it was, this idea of let, let's get let's let James do his thing here, but I'm sure there was some vision, even if it was a very broad one, in your head about what the end result would be. And I'm curious if there were any big surprises along the way, either during the process or with the final result. Yeah, I think one thing that I had hoped for and just paid off, just in such an extraordinary way, was the just the generosity of expertise from the people that we were working with. You know, I knew a couple people that I could ask. A lot of it was looking at university websites and finding a biologist whose research looked cool and sending an email. And everyone was just so quick to embrace the concept of this project, to the embrace the idea of working with James, to bring them into their homes and in spaces that you know they really treasure as theirs that have deep family histories. And it was something I was uncertain of because you know, when we think of Texas and we think of conservation, we think of private property and that no trespassing sign that can be a very dangerous line <laughs> often. And, <laughs> and we were able to kind of have the privilege of crossing that and experiencing some really special, special things. And I think like watching this project evolve as well within the gallery and when we're thinking about the work has been, you know, seeing the concept as I envisioned it initially kind of turn into something that feels both really familiar and totally new has been really unique. Cause like, I don't, I knew we had some ideas early on for watercolors and things, but the ideas such as the mural and the sculptures were things that just kind of not to use the pun, I'm going to use the flowered up <laughs> in the, the midst of, of all of this. We're, we're really unique um, and unexpected and surprising, but also we're just expressions of these ideas that James has been thinking about for such a long time. Like, there, like I said before, there's a, a real clarity of vision to what he's doing and the way he investigates and reworks these visual conventions that are so foundational to Euro-American art that they almost go unspoken. And you see James's work and it looks familiar. It looks like a botanical drawing. It looks like a Peterson Field Guide. And you start spending time with it and then the ground just sort of falls out beneath you. And you're realizing that you're looking at art that is totally at cross purposes with what you think it's supposed to be doing and making you question really fundamental assumptions. So on that level, I think James' work is like almost fundamentally surprising because it's about dismantling or not even dismantling, but seeing what happens when you step across those lines and step across those familiar boundaries that you rely on to navigate the world. I will quickly echo just the, the generosity of people who... Um helped us and welcomed us onto their property or spent time with us. And I could call out a lot of names, um, but I, I won't right now. But I, 
it, there were lines, though, that Matt, on a couple of occasions, was like, I wouldn't cross that barbed wire fence if I was you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you see that house up there? <laughs> I wanted to grab that milkweed plant, but he advised me not to. <laughs> uh, um, James, you strike me in all of our conversation. I mean, you're a, a deep learner. I, I thought I was curious, and you, you blow me out of the water with wow. curiosity. And, and so Sorry. when you, you learned all about grasslands, you, you finished the project. It is installed, but it's... It strikes me that you're, it's still very much of interest to you, and maybe you, know, you installed it, but you're still going with your journey of grasslands. Um, what have you learned since, since you, you've you know, finished the project? But I think you're, you're still coming down, you're still visiting, you're still learning. What, what's I can't in your keep rattling away around from in your Texas. brain? I just yeah. love it here. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's I, rattling around in your brain now? Well, Congrats. well, we're finishing up a book, which I'm excited about, which is kind of a catalog from the exhibition, but it won't be out till September with okay. Rizzoli Publishers. That's not a plug, but it could be. <laughs> but I, uh, and it's called Grasslands, and it, it's, um, but it, it evolved out of this project, obviously. And so I'm excited about that, and I'm finishing, I'm the last person to finish their essay, because I'm always behind on stuff. And, uh, <laughs> but, so I, but yes, the the a lot of the things I do start with a, an agitation, and the thing that's really agitating me in a, in a good way, I mean, but really deeply is that like I can't understand why I'm 48 years old, I've been interested in nature my entire life. How has it taken so long for me to learn that my backyard was not a forested Eden, like you know, the myths that were sort of pushed by the Europeans. It was, it was at best a mixed habitat. Edges, you know, between grasses and woods are what heightens biodiversity. The more kinds of habitat you have, the more kinds. So that the indigenous people burned not, you know, they needed some trees to make campfires and, and stuff. <laughs> but they burned through forests. They burned to prevent fires, to, pre to prevent catastrophic fires. The big, the big sort of thing that I'm still puzzling through and finding more and more evidence for is that there's this huge myth that the indigenous people had a low impact on the land, that somehow they lived in concert. They did live in concert with it, but, but this burning thing is a they significantly changed the landscape for thousands of years. If you burn every year for thousands of years, you're going to change the evolution of plants. You're going to change the composition of the soil. You're going to change everything. And when the Europeans came, it's not a judgment. It's just what happened. They suppressed fire. A, li a lightning struck, or they didn't burn it intentionally. And when that stopped cold, it was like, yeah, like, what do they call it when an alcoholic stops drinking? Or it's like, <laughs> it's like a depend the land was dependent on fire, and then it was ceased. Uh -huh. And this, but yes, these, when you find one of these remnant prairies, sometimes they're only 10 acres the, where the land has never been plowed or, or, um, or overgrazed. Um, sometimes they're old cemeteries because people started burying their dead there in the 18, early 1800s, and they never plowed it because there were dead people in the ground. So you can go there and see some rare prairie plants. But I started to feel like these things, and, and in conversation with Matt too, really were like ancient. You, when you walk into one, you're walking into an ancient uh, collaboration between humans and the land. It's not just wild, it's not wilderness. This idea that, you know, there were places that were inaccessible to people that they didn't go that much in the yeah. mountains and stuff. Of course, there's a place for wilderness as an idea. But that even in my backyard that I didn't know that, or even was taught or thought that the land was managed. Of course it was managed. That's what humans do. Humans manipulate the environment to suit their needs. And that's exactly what the people that lived here for a long, long time did. And, and um, I could go on and on, but that's a big one. I mean, yeah. I, I don't know where that'll go. <laughs> It'll go into, you know, projects I'm, I've already been working on, like I've been working this book about how and why we name and order nature and this conflict between the bounded or tension between the bounded and the boundless. And I feel like fire will make its way in there, but yeah, I, I mean, it could manifest as artwork, uh, exhibitions, hopefully, maybe not about fire, but, you know, just yeah. more about this, this question of, are, 
do we really know what we're like what we're looking at or what was here or what was it like before humans came here you know anyway sorry yes well it's and i really think... like stirring <laughs> <laughs> well and i think this idea of fire which kind of came in part way through the project like it almost feels to me like when i go upstairs and i look at those cast bronze sculptures that like they're finished and beautiful and extraordinary and feel like that kind of the first chapter in a new set of ideas because I think those sculptures are almost deceptive in how fundamental of questions that they are posing about how we represent the world because you step in and you look like okay these are burned logs and flowers like they transposed them into the real space and it takes you a long time to see the artifice that's there because of how extraordinary the naturalism is. It's just such a feat. But there's, I experienced this shift that happens where once you see the artifice and you see the permanence of the bronze, the fragility of the clay, the care of the brushwork, all of a sudden you have this object that's so fundamentally different than the thing that you're representing, which is inherently ephemeral. It's inherently impermanent. It's about these cycles of life and death and growth and destruction, all these forces that when we're in a museum, we're doing everything we can to keep them at bay. You know, we want the art to last forever and look exactly the same. And James, James's sculptures seem to be posing this really profound question about when we're attempting to work with and engage with the natural world on such a close, intimate level, that end product still has this gulf or this boundary that we're navigating and thinking through and I find that endlessly fascinating, and I'm really excited to see how that dimension of engaging with fire and its sort of creative capacities is, is going to go. A so. um, few more questions for me, and then we'll open it up to, to you guys for questions. You know, my background, uh, even though I'm from Eastern North Carolina with this Eastern North Carolina accent, most of my career has been some somewhat associated with uh, Western lands conservation, a lot of grasslands conservation. And so you guys have been through this great process of, you know, digging deep into grasslands and you've had the great pleasure of meeting with some of the, you know, the foremost experts and conservation organizations, private land stewards. I feel like Texas is really the ground zero for some of the most innovative private land stewardship uh, in the country, especially when it comes to grasslands. How are you feeling about conservation about the state of grasslands. James, you strike me as, a, as an optimist. I mean, do you, give me your thoughts from, if you put on your conservationist naturalist hat, how are you feeling? Good? Or, yeah. or a realist, maybe. I yeah. don't know. I, I, no, I'm alarmed at, from a conservation perspective. The, just from personal observations, again, traveling with Matt, we, we covered a bunch of states and we're visiting little cemetery prairies and remnants, small, tiny places. And Everywhere else, you don't hear the grassland birds, but you pull up to one of these sites and immediately hear, you hear the bobwhite quail, you hear the, the, the dick sissels, the, the um, bells vireos, the, the, the meadowlarks. And it, it's like you realize that the monoculture, the crops, it, the, they're not good for biodiversity. And... Um, we're losing birds like crazy. It's it's really sad, and I I want to hear the birds. I mean, I, I I noticed a difference from when I was a kid in Connecticut. We lose so many birds just in window kills. I mean, it's not just like everything. It's just a it's a gauntlet. It's and it's not it's not going to get it could get better. But I I just I guess my hope is that um, these these really precious sites that exist can be preserved at least as a library of biodiversity that mm -hmm. you know we can maybe build on that the enthusiasm for restoration was pretty huge in some of the several thousand acre ranches we visited like they're really trying we don't know if you can restore a prairie i yeah. mean it it could take 200 years i mean to get that that thing we don't know that special sauce that <laughs> The, the mycorrhizal fungus, the roots of the, the grass is holding the water in a certain way. I don't know if that can be recreated. Again, it's been fragmented to the, to the point where that trauma is so severe, we don't know if you can return it. Mm -hmm. But you can try. I mean, I actually started a little grassland restoration, or I mean, 
next to my house, we have some meadows, and I planted about a quarter acre of native grasses and wildflowers. And it's, it's a constant you know, fight between the non-natives and the natives. Mm -hmm. And the, I didn't know until I started this project that the grasses that I grew up looking at were all introduced from Europe as hay crops, Timothy, orchard oh, yeah. grass. Yeah. Um, but, and I, I walk in that little quarter acre now three years after I started it, and it feels different. And I've, mm. I've been burning. I burned it last winter, and I'm going to burn it again. <laughs> um, I don't ask anybody. I just burn it. Um, <laughs> But Want me to edit that out? That no, no, that? not at all. I mean, I grew up in the town where I live. I think the local they volunteer know firemen know me, so <laughs> it's okay. I live in Easton, Connecticut. Come get me. <laughs> um, I might burn it next week. <laughs> um, but I'm learning by doing that. I, I learned a lot by by taking my yeah. propane tank and the torch and setting it on fire. I learned I learned that this the switchgrass went up really fast and. Um, a little gust of wind came up, and I was afraid for about two seconds. I was like, ooh, this is getting out of hand. But then, it, but once it burned out, it burned out. It burns, and it, it's just done, you know. And, and, and a couple of times, I had to try to light it again because there wasn't enough fuel on the ground, not enough dead grass. So um, anyway, I, uh, I guess I try to be optimistic. I, I'm, I'm excited to continue to learn and to work with people who are doing great things. There's a lot of great things being done out there. And there's people in this room who are involved in incredibly important conservation work. And I think enough people care. And, and obviously, bringing young people out in remnant prairies and showing them. I couldn't see. And I, I, I feel like I'm a pretty good observer. I mm -hmm. couldn't see these landscapes until somebody took me out and showed me. I could have driven by these remnant prairies and had no idea what was there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it did, they don't jump out and, you know, it's not like a flamingo flying by yeah. or something. It's, they're very subtle. And very it, subtle. It, takes, it takes a little bit of an education. Um, and uh, so that's necessary, too, if we want to protect these sites. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll be able to, you know, create corridors for where burning can happen and people can see the effects and how, how they, you know, help return nutrients to the soil and, and create this regeneration um, that no other force can. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I moved to Colorado for the big mountains, but after my years and years of spending time in eastern Colorado in the grasslands, I've fallen in love. And it took many, many years, but there's, there's so much going on there. Um, one more question for you, one more question for you. One of the things that I really focus on on my podcast is I want it to be a resource. I want people to hear the conversations, and then they're uh, inspired to go out and learn more. And every time I talk to you, I'm taking notes and I have a long list of books I want to read or other resources. And I feel like that's the mark of whether it's a book or a conversation, if it sparks an interest. And so I know one book you're going to mention, but I wonder if you could name a few different resources that people in here might be able to go off on their own and educate themselves on grasslands if they're not already. Well, I have to m mention Matt White's book, Prairie Time, which is, you know, he, Matt's a real Texan. He grew up in East Texas. Um, it's about the Blackland Prairies, which are not far from here, and um, so that's called Prairie Time. It's a really, really good book, and I read it before I met Matt, and then I met him, and I was like, oh, I read your book, and that was sort of a connection. So, uh, you know, um, I, in, the, in terms of my, my sort of interest in this relationship between humans and, and fire, not the whole book, but Changes in America by William Cronin, mm -hmm. um, is a is a big big one about just New England and how the landscape changed with the people who were there for thousands of years and how it changed when Europeans came and how that tension created interest very interesting changes. Um, but he he also like Pine is very clear that like indigenous people managed the land in a certain kind of way and the land that the Europeans encountered was a land that had been managed. Um, Intensively, um, I, I'm not sure I'd recommend all these books like as reading <laughs> material, but um, you know, Fire in America by Stephen Pine. Um, there's a book by a guy named Omer Stewart called Forgotten Fires mm -hmm. <laughs> that um, he was a an anthropologist at UC Berkeley in the in the 40s and 50s, and he, he'd written a whole manuscript about all this stuff, and he couldn't get it published. Um, I think partly because 
you know, the narrative was so anti-fire. But people were really, like, breaking ground and even interviewing, he was in California interviewing indigenous people about how they used fire. And there's, like, like real oral accounts um, that are really important. Um, so I, yeah, I like to, I like to kind of, you know, my Antonia, <laughs> mm -hmm. I hadn't read it. I hadn't read Willa Cather until this project started. Um, it's a good one. It really is. <laughs> uh, some of these, I must confess, I don't always read, but I'm listening to them while I'm painting or something. It's a way that I can do research while I'm drawing. Um, and, uh, so yeah, there's more. Those are great. Um, Spencer, I had the pleasure this morning of have you sh having you show me around the space up there. And I think that's a, a pretty cool deal to be able to have the curator of a, of an exhibit tell you exactly his thought process of how it all came together. And so for my final question to you, and then we'll open it up. Um, I'd love for you to kind of talk about that space. Cause if I remember correctly, you said it's the 11th 11th show you've done up there. Is that right? Something, something yeah. around there. Yeah. And so as people have the opportunity to go up and look around when we're done here, could you just talk a bit about the space and kind of your thought process of getting it all set up? Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting gallery within the, the Carter's exhibition space in that it's the kind of the, it's the most intimate special exhibition space we have, which really creates an opportunity to have really close, intimate encounters with smaller groups. It's, it's a great way to explore one idea really thoroughly and carefully. And with an artist like James, where you're going to be spending time being drawn into these subtle details, this, um, you know, almost deceptive naturalism that's luring you in with something familiar and presenting you as something completely different, you need kind of that time and space to have these encounters with art that are really intense. And so a lot of the work, honestly, putting this together was, I'd say, akin to being an editor almost in some level in that I think one of the most important things that you aspire to and probably never fully achieve in curatorial work is just really attending to the art and really trying to understand what that consistent through line is and trying to present the work on its own terms as clearly and accessibly as you can. And that's different for every project because you might have work that's really difficult and thorny and challenging that you need to kind of create a context to help visitors to step into. And with James, the work was really accessible and we had million ideas. <laughs> like, I mean, there were really, I think, 10 or so potential avenues of different types of work, um, different possibilities for organizing the space. And really a lot of my role was saying, you know, James, here's what I'm hearing as this through line that's surfacing again and again and again. And here are the kind of the three ways I think we can give some space and, and clarity to that, that. And it ended up really being bodies of work that look familiar from historical conventions. You know, Peterson field guides, like such a fundamental way that we encounter nature. Botanical specimen drawings, which we use to flip through and identify and say that's a type. And then just this pristine, meticulous naturalism that's manifest in the sculptures. You know, those were three dimensions out of the 10 or so that seemed consistently about upending a historic visual tradition. And that to me felt kind of like the core of the project from an art historical perspective is thinking about how these spaces, these extraordinary prairies, you know, these city medians in Elk River, Minnesota, that if you really care for them and spend time with them and become attentive to them can just, just, just shatter a lot of the categories and conceptions that we have of what nature is. And it just kind of proceeded from there. You know, James is a really great collaborator with a lot of curatorial experience himself. And so we could really work together to lay this out, talk about how the energy and rhythm of the space would feel moving through it. You know, Cause it's not just a book that you're reading. It's not an argument you're flipping through. You are an embodied presence who's stepping in and might see this first and this second and need a little time to dwell over here. And this space is really great for kind of creating this leisurely encounter with a bunch of distinct but interrelated ideas. If that's kind of abstract, I think I some it. level it's kind of intuitive. It 
you wait until it feels right and you spend a lot of time trying to figure out what feels right. And this show I felt like has felt right as a space and an argument more so than any of the other projects that were there, which I think is just a testament to the, the caliber of the work. So, Well, thank you. And hopefully everybody will have a chance to go up there and look at it with that context again, because it's that was very helpful to me this morning. All right, we've got time. We've got... 16 minutes, and I've been told we have to be done at 7.30, so everybody has time to go take another look. So I see firsthand back this way. Here, let me bring the microphone. Yeah, we would like to reminder. record the questions. would be great. Hi. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to say how exciting and, and, and awesome it is to have an exhibit like this in, our, in Fort Worth that promotes conservation, prairies, and, and fire, because I'm a I love fire, too. <laughs> I love fire. In fact, Fort Worth needs to set more fires on our prairies. But uh, my question is, I'm, I was born and raised in Fort Worth, and I'm a Fort Worth guy, and I seek out the natural areas of Fort Worth. What, what, what was your relationship, or what is your relationship like it, it, to Fort Worth? And did you seek out, I know you did probably visit some prairies, but did you seek out places like Tandy Hills and the Fort Worth Nature Center that has our largest prairies? And let me know if you ha found any remnant prairies in Fort Worth, because I'd love to know. Thanks. Do you want me to handle that? I guess. Go for it. Yeah. I, uh, no, one of, the, one of the first places that Matt took me to was Tandy Hills and, and it, two years ago in, in April. And the prairie paintbrush, Castilea, Purpurea was blooming, these bunches of like crazy magenta flowers. It looked like Candyland, if you ever played that board game as a kid. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it looked like lollipops sticking out of the ground. Um, I, you know, Matt also took me to um, White Rock Lake, which is a, a remnant prairie in Dallas, like right in the middle of Dallas, and showed me a stand of um, camas lilies blooming. And he's like, you know, there was a, there's a spring up there and he's like, I'm pretty sure these were planted by Native Americans, you know, hundreds of years ago. And, and I'm like, how do you know that? He's like, I just can feel it. You know, it's just like he's been around these landscapes enough that, and I believe him. I mean, that's another thing that people always do is they move things that they eat, they, they use, and they plant them in different places, um, whether it's black walnut or persimmon or whatever. Um, so I, I would strongly urge you to have a conversation with Matt about remnant prairies within driving distance of Fort Worth and because they're also turned into, you know, cool trips visiting post office murals <laughs> from the WPA areas because there's historical evidence of what the land looked like in the 40s whenever those were painted. Um, so that was, you know, I don't want to talk too much about Matt, but he's, a, <laughs> he's also a history teacher, so he... he he carries that. And the layers of history that, you know, when you drive around Texas or, or I mean, obviously there were all kinds of atrocities and, and settlements and, you know, the, those layers of history are also mixed in with the land. And, and knowing some of those things helps you see, you know, read, read what happened or what may have happened. But, um, I, but in terms of Fort Worth, I, I really like Fort Worth. I've grown to... <laughs> I mean, it, you have three incredible museums within walking distance of each other. Um, it, the, I happen to really like Western culture, so I like that, that twang of the West here. Um, I just, I like it. I don't know how, to, how else to describe it. And I still haven't been to the rodeo, so I... <laughs> <laughs> and I've only been to the stockyards once, but I... But, I, but the landscape, and, and there, there are some real, like, soil lines between like the Blackland Prairie and the, and the um, I forget what they call the, the, the breaks or the, the different, um, you guys know better because you're from here, but the what, the cross timbers, yeah, the, so there are, you know, I'm, I'm about like, oh, there's no boundaries in nature and, and Matt will be like, yeah, there really are some yeah. boundaries, <laughs> you know, they're boundaries, yes, I know they're, they're boundaries, but they're not boundaries, you know, I'm different than a cat, you know, I can't breed with a cat and create for a lost spring, yes, they're technically different, but really they're also integrated and interacting in an ecosystem. One of the, one of the um, friend of mine here, um, I'll call her Carla, um, <laughs> took me to some remnant prairies in, outside of Houston, the coastal prairies, and 
and we were with some people from the Nature Conservancy, this guy, Jaime Gonzalez, and he, he said something really interesting to me, which has been resonating ever since, which um, is that like, even though the bison aren't here anymore roaming the prairies in massive herds, as they had for however many thousands of years, um, their presence is still in the plants that they, because the plants evolve with these creatures. So even though the bison's no longer there, there's sort of this genetic memory of the bison still in the living plants. So when you visit these remnant prairies, you're not only seeing plants, but you're, you, you're sort of intuiting. I really feel like there's a, there's a presence in these places that you can't describe. I'm not, I'm telling you this, you know this, but I, you can feel that the weight of that history, I feel. And because they are there, they, and, and I think that nature has a collective memory of everything that ever existed. Nothing ever really goes away in our bodies because we evolved with everything and we evolved from single cell organisms. If you believe in evolution, that I, I feel like we are a record of all the residue, everything that ever happened on the planet. Um, maybe even dinosaurs. So. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Yes, I would, I'd recommend a conversation with that guy about remnant prairies, but I'm just a Connecticut Yankee who <laughs> really likes Texas, and I like Fort Worth. And we strong-armed Matt earlier, and he's going to come on the podcast and have to endure a bunch of questions from me, so there'll be more, more coming. Any other uh, questions? Got one right here. So thank you so much for representing Texas outside of Texas. I'm real appreciative of that, but at the same time, I grew up on a ranch myself. Controlled burns was like a daily, unfortunate thing, and along came the allergies. But my question is, like, where did all this bias come from? Because, yeah, I see the fires in Hawaii. I see the fires in California. And it's so clear that there's very little land management going on in these locations. And I just, I, I don't understand what, what's changed. Well, I mean, do you want me to answer this? Yeah. <laughs> what's, I think the big fundamental thing that's changed is that fire has been suppressed for so long that the fuel loads, you know, picture a forest. The Indians would burn to prevent fires. They would burn around their camps because it creates a fire break. If you burn, there's no fuel for a fire to go anywhere. So they would burn through forests. But if you burn regularly, you burn the, the leaves, the underbrush. Um, it made it easier to navigate through the forest. It made it easier for them to to hunt without being detected because anybody who's walked on dead leaves knows it's, it makes a lot of noise. Um, this is all described very clearly by um, a lot of different people in the past. So, so the, the issue, the reason fires are so bad today, and this is, I'm not an expert on fire, but I've been trying to learn more, <laughs> is that fire, if a lightning strike happens and starts a fire, we put it out. Fire. Every time a fire, natural or man-made, anthropogenic fire or natural fire, we put it out. And that's, that's a problem because the fuel load, all the dead wood, you, you, I walk through forests in my backyard, it's all the dead stuff is, you know, for 40, 50 years is on the ground. And if a fire starts, it has the potential to burn hotter and faster. Fires, when the indigenous people burned through the forest, wouldn't burn the trees because there wasn't enough fuel to get the fire going. But if you, if you have so much dead material that the fire's huge, it's going to burn everything. And how many millions of acres burned in Canada last year? Um, that was also something that, that happened in the past. But I think, again, the, po the, the problem, according to people like Stephen Pine, Pine who I really think is the, the fire historian, <laughs> he's written like 10 books about fire around the world and how humans have used it. Um, it's that, they call it the fuel load. The fuel load is built up to very dangerous levels. Houses are also part of that fuel load. You know, unfortunately, the nomadism and the way that people lived with fire had to be, you know, not, not sedentary because it was a life following migratory animals and fires, you know, can't be controlled when they get really big. Um, and, and native people died in fires. It's not like they always knew exactly what was going to happen when they set a huge prairie fire. There's paintings in this collection upstairs that I think Remington, right? They're setting a, a, a prairie fire. Um, but um, anyway, I think that's one of the fundamental problems. 
There's a great book by Timothy Egan called Oh, that's Big, a new book. Yeah, right. Big Burn, and it's about Theodore Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot and their kind of the federal policy about suppressing fires in the early 1900s, and that kind of sets the stage. That's been very helpful for me. That book's getting a lot yeah. of attention, yeah. All right, we got one in the middle. Excuse me. <laughs> Thanks for your work. Quick question. Significance of the Rio Grande cutthroat trout in the Ooh, painting. Nice. And, uh, and I was thinking in particular about its name, um, well, its technical name, and wondering whether there was some thread there. Yeah, well, there is. I mean, it, it's a little controversial, but I, I grew up, my first major obsession was trout. <laughs> <laughs> and my first book, which came out in 1996, was called um, Trout. <laughs> 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 and it was a book of paintings of watercolors of trout. Um, and uh, when we Matt was pretty adamant that we make a trip to West Texas because he was like, Texas was a grassland state. The entire state was a grassland. It's only, you know, it's Chihuahuan Desert. You know, there's not a lot of rain. But um, the, uh, the um, uh, you know, the landscapes changed because it was overgrazed and... and and fires were suppressed, and now it's you know creosote bush and cactuses and lechuguilla and and which were there, but they've they've overtaken what was more probably a compositionally grass. Um, anyway, the the Rio Grande, you know, the Pecos River, and I think west of the Pecos is the Trans Pecos. I'm not an expert, but um, I knew that there were trout native to the Rio Grande headwaters in New Mexico and stuff because I. Is it Arizona or New Mexico? I think New Mexico, because um, I, you know, been so obsessed with trout for so long, and um, I'd read that there were accounts of there having been native trout in West Texas in tributaries, upper mountain tributaries in the Davis Mountains, of the uh, of the of the Rio Grande, you know, headwaters. So um, I thought slightly controversial. I'll paint the native Texas trout, which not everybody can agree existed. But based on the accounts that I've read, it definitely existed. I would say 150%. There were native trout in Texas. Um, and anybody who's been in those mountains knows that it's not like what everybody would think of what Texas looks like. Um, but so I put it on that big prairie composition in the, in the corner as part of a nod to my childhood passion for trout, but also a nod to the uncertainties about what the land was like um, years ago. And now it's pretty certain that they're gone, but how cool would it be to rediscover the native Texas trout? <laughs> I would make it the new state animal. <laughs> <laughs> the, the brook trout. What's that? A moss. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, cool. Well, Salvalinus fontanalis is the brook trout. Um, you could say that on your next podcast interview. Next that book. was part of the plan all along. Um, Madeline? We've got time for, I think, just one more question. Okay, and we've got one down this row. Uh, uh, this is sort of related to the previous question, but um, I like fly fishing. I also like painting watercolors of the fish I catch, and I've noticed there's a Guadalupe bass in your nice. prairie composition there. I was wondering if you did any fly fishing uh, during your field research. I would say that's one regret. I don't think I brought a rod on any of the trips, um, but we did see Guadalupe or Guadalupe bass in uh, the headwaters of the Guadalupe in the water, <laughs> and I think what was the the creek in Shield Ranch that had water creek? I'm drawing a blank. He said he said that this rancher said that they were Guadalupe bass in a little beautiful. Uh, that was one of the first sites we went to. Was this guy um, Blake Murden? Blake Murden was was so into this stand of Indian grass that he'd restored. He was like, I mean, really going like fits of rapture, and <laughs> and it was. And that was one of the first, I'm like, what's he, is he talking about grass? <laughs> <laughs> and, but about how the deep roots hold the water. And he said, as soon as, once they'd restored some grasses around the headwaters of this creek, the water filled up again in the creek because without the roots holding the water back, I'm telling 
a lot of people things they know, but the water just runs off the land and isn't retained. So with the, with the, with the um, return of the water, it helped the Guadalupe bass. But I, I did talk about going to try to catch one, but that's one thing that hasn't happened. So maybe, hopefully, leave something for a future trip. <laughs> but I did paint it. Um, oh, wow. Well, this has been great. I, after my first conversation with James, and then I'm thinking it again after this second one, I feel like his his artwork kind of speaks for itself, and it's just so stunning and so beautiful, but it's really the tip of the iceberg. And when you see the depth of his thought and his curiosity and his experimentation and just how how much is going on behind the scenes, it makes this beautiful art even more stunning and more interesting, and it makes me think, and I'm going to be thinking, I probably won't sleep much tonight because I'll be thinking wow. about this, but thank you, you so much. If you much. spend enough time around me, you'll realize I repeat myself a lot. So <laughs> it might sound novel the first time around, but then it... <laughs> well, thank you all. Thank you. That was great. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. All right. Thank you all so much again for your wonderful questions. Thank you, Ed, James, Spencer, for your thought-provoking conversation. I invite you upstairs to our mezzanine to check out Trespassers in the last 30 minutes of tonight's Second Thursday. Thanks, all. Thank you, everybody, for coming. <laughs>